and um, welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is about regional identity in um, Austria. Um, you're all very welcome. The attendee numbers are still going up, but we're going to get um, started. Um, and just before I hand over to the winemakers, I'm going to uh, say a few words about why we chose this um, topic, uh, which is part of the webinar series that we're having for our portfolio month. Um, most of you probably know that at Wine Mason, we have a fairly extensive Austrian portfolio. We work with six different wineries in five different regions and with a host of different great varieties and styles. Um, and, you know, we've worked with Austria a long time. I was first in Austria in 2010. And um, at that time, while I think I knew something about the grape varieties and possibly only Gruner Veltliner, um, I certainly had very little or no idea about uh, the regions. Um, 11 years on from that and um, several visits and, you know, presentations and uh, more reading and research and tasting, you know, I do feel or believe I understand the regions um, a lot better, but um, I, I still don't believe I understand them well enough. And there has been a lot of change that has been happening in Austria um, in that time. Um, you know, even in that time from 2010 to 2000 and, and to now, you know, there's been more than a doubling in, in the number of DACs and there's been significant developments in um, other important um, appellation and regional classification systems. So you're all professionals here. Um, we've got journalists, we have um, sommeliers, we have people who work in the on trade. And I know that um, if I were to ask uh, you to name uh, important vineyard areas in um, an important premier or Grand Cru's in other parts of the world, let's say France, for example, it wouldn't be a problem. You'd have a list as, as long as your arm. Um, and there are many reasons for that, of course. Um, market share, um, you know, the size of the country, and um, just maybe we've traveled there um, uh, more frequently. But, you know, I would do wonder how many of us, and I'm going to count myself in this, could actually name all 16 DACs or you know, more than a handful of single vineyards or Erstelaga or, or reeds. Um, so that's not to make us feel bad that we can't do that. But so uh, our objective today, and this is why we've kind of put this webinar in place, is to encourage a better understanding of um, the regions. And we're gonna focus on Camtal, Carnuntum and Bergenland. And I suppose to promote a curiosity to um, explore uh, you know, the different regions uh, and Appalachian systems of Austria a little more deeply. So presenting um, today, uh, we had lined up three winemakers. Um, unfortunately, um, Gerhard Pitnauer got a last minute call to have a um, back hospital appointment. And so he's not able to join us, but Dorley Moore is going to speak um, about his winery and about his region. So she'll cover both of those when She's talking about um, as well about Carnuntum and her own region. And before Dorley, um, I'm going to ask um, Michael Moosebrugger um, of Slosh Goebelsberg in Camptal to um, start uh, in, a, in a second. Uh, just I'll just do some housekeeping. Um, so we have Michael Moosebrugger and Dorley who will be covering this topic. So Sinead McCarthy is with me today in the background. Lots of you know her. So she is going to be managing the Q and A and the chat. And we would really love if you could post your questions into the Q&A or the chat if you prefer. And we will leave enough time, I think, at the end to, to, um, to address those. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Michael to uh, maybe turn off his um, video and, um, and to start the session for us. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, heartily welcome from, from my side. I would like to uh, I would like to introduce you today uh, a little bit into the, the history and the, the structure uh, of Austria, uh, its significant uh, appellation system, and all questions that are involved. Uh, Barbara already mentioned that um, Austria can seem to be you know, quite complicated. Uh, I would like to prove that 
Austria uh, is, is not so complicated at all. And, um, uh, and so I would like to share uh, a few pictures with you that makes it a little bit easier to understand um, the, everything that is uh, connected to Austria and, and then later on to Schloss Goldsberg. Now, um, Schloss Goldsburg is, uh, uh, is a very historical estate. Uh, we are celebrating 850 years uh, to this year. And, um, and for some reasons, I, I always try to explain that the overall history of the estate is also somehow a history of Austria and Austrian, Austrian vineyards. And when you're looking to the, to the history of, uh, uh, of Austrian wine, you can state that the history is going back quite far back, even you know, before Celtic times. And, uh, but there were basically two major uh, developments that had the biggest impact in the development of Austrian vineyards. Uh, as you can imagine, first of all, uh, the Roman Empire um, the, the Danube has been serving as uh, the northern border for the Roman Empire. Uh, you see here, uh, this is Carnuntum, where Dorli, uh, that we meet later on, uh, is located, uh, close to that Vienna, and, and also we are going then along the Danube uh, River to the west. Now, uh, during this period of the, of the Romans, uh, major developments were made for Austrian vineyards, so uh, it's a kind of a, a kind of a fundament that have been that that you know was laid down actually during this period. The second, the second most important development was between the Middle Ages and the time of secularization. So basically, the time of the French Revolution. It's a period that where winemaking is in principle dominated by monasteries and monks. Um, there's a very simple reason to that. You have to imagine that uh, in 11th, 12th, four, up to 14th, 15th century, monks were some of the only ones who could read and write. And uh, this is the reason why they carried out agriculture on a scientific level. And uh, therefore, uh, monks were some of those who were trying to find the best sites for wine production. Uh, they tried to improve uh, practices in the vineyards. They tried to improve the winemaking. And so we have to thank uh, all these developments uh, uh, to them. And uh, so they, they laid down uh, a, a, a great fundament uh, in their developments to what we find today uh, in, in Austrian wine. I'm, I'm not going now too much into the details of of Austrian history of, of wines and winemaking. There uh, is a fantastic publication uh, came out last year uh, about the history of Austrian wine. So for everyone who is interested in, in more details on, on historical aspects of Austrian wine, uh, there is the possibility to order that book either via Amazon or via the Austrian uh, Wine Marketing Board. <clears throat> Uh, today, uh, Austrian wine industry is a family-based industry. Uh, it's, a, it's a young generation that, uh, that has uh, taken over from, from, the, from the past. And uh, it's, a, it's a generation that is uh, very innovative, that uh, has uh, on one side, you know, the history and the traditions in their mind, uh, but is also, uh, is also eager actually to try out uh, new things uh, try out um, um, new possibilities, um, is going into new architecture, uh, new styles of wine. Uh, so a, a very innovative uh, generation without forgetting uh, the traditions and, uh, and the traditional uh, and classical styles of, of Austrian wine culture. Now, when it comes to the structure of Austrian vineyard, uh, you all know that the biggest part of Austria today is covered by the Alps. Uh, as you can see here, this is the reason why Austrian vineyards are basically located in the eastern parts uh, of, of Austria. And we are differentiating 
uh, between three major areas uh, of wine production. So you have the most southern part uh, here uh, in the south, an area that is called Steiermark or Styria. And uh, it's an area where producers are concentrating on Sauvignon Blanc and on Chardonnay. So this is white wine production area, a lovely area, very picturesque, uh, really uh, lovely to visit, uh, great restaurants, um, a great picturesque area. Um, so uh, really, if you're coming to Austria, worthwhile actually going there. Then you see that uh, the Danube is passing through Austria, coming here from Germany, uh, passing through Austria and departing via Slovakia and Hungary in the direction to the Black Sea. And basically everything that you find here in the eastern part and uh, south of the Danube is concentrating on red wine production, whereas everything along the Danube and north of the Danube is white wine production based on Grüner Veltliner and, and Riesling. Uh, it does not appear as such here on this picture, but basically this part here north of the Danube counts for about two thirds of Austrian vineyards. So this here is, uh, is, is, has a quite a big share actually of the, of the overall uh, production in, in Austria. And this is why internationally Austria is rather recalled as a white wine producing country than a red wine producing country. Now, um, looking, looking now a little bit closer um, to, uh, to these appellations uh, that you can see, uh, you see here, this is Canuntum, this is where Dolly uh, is at home, and, uh, and also Gerhard is from the Burgenland, so a little bit uh, here to the south. Uh, and Dolly will explain a little bit more details about this, so this is why I'm continuing here to the Danube region and to the Danube appellations. Uh, you see here uh, Vienna, which is the capital of Austria, and the Danube regions and appellations are basically here west of Vienna. Um, the distance is not very far. It's about uh, 45 to one hour to get from the center of Vienna actually to, to the vineyards. Um, so there's basically no, no distances. Um, and uh, having a closer look to that, uh, you can see that uh, uh, when, you, when you're looking into this area, uh, that we are talking here about the valley uh, landscape. Now, uh, the overall, overall production in Austria is about 45,000 hectares, which is quite significant. You have to consider um, Burgundy is 33,000 hectares, Champagne is 37,000 hectares. So 45,000 hectares is quite a significant size. And the Danube uh, appellations here, what you can see on this picture, counts for about 10,000 hectares, which is about comparable to the Côte d'Or uh, in Burgundy. It's just you know, to, 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 to have an, about a, a little impression about the sizes and uh, about what significance we, we, are, we are talking about. Now, uh, talking about, uh, talking about um, uh, uh, the valleys of the Danube, uh, you can see here the, the Danube is forming the main valley uh, of this region. And then you have the side valleys uh, of the Danube. You have the valley of the Krems River, you have the valley of the Kemp River, and then you have the valley of the Trison River from the south, from the Alps. And, uh, uh, and all these appellations are basically named after these valleys. In German, Tal means valley, so the translation of Kremstal would be the valley of the Krems River. Kamtal, the valley of the Kemp River, Treisental, the valley of the Trison River. Now, um, here are a few pictures that you get in, a little bit in, an image about, you know, what we are talking about. Uh, so this here in the background, you see the town of, of Krems, uh, terraced vineyards along, uh, along the Danube. Um, the Trison Valley uh, in winter time. Uh, then you see the Wachau uh, Valley um, and uh, the Wagram uh, and the Kamtal uh, here with the famous uh, Heiligenstein here on the on the right side. Now, when you're coming into this area, you instantly realize that you are looking to two archetypes of vineyard sites. 
you have on one side, you have terraced vineyards along the Danube and the side rivers. So vineyards that are very dry, high mineralization in the soil. So this is, easy, this is ideal for Riesling production. On the other side, you find vineyards that are based on less on clay. So vineyards with a good water supply to the wine, which is ideal for the grape variety of Grüner Veltliner. This is quite important to understand. Grüner Veltliner and Riesling are complementary grapes. What one likes, the other doesn't like, and the other way around. And as we have those two opposing structures, we need also to, those two grape varieties to cover the needs uh, of our vineyard sites. Now, when it comes to the appellation system, uh, it's in fact, it's quite easy to understand because here we have similarities uh, to other appellations. Uh, we are dividing the appellation into three categories of wine. So you have the wines of the region, you have the wines of the village, and then you have the wines of the single vineyard that we call in Austria Ried. So it's like Riedel without the L. Uh, and uh, uh, the, this term of Ried is a historical term. So it's the legal term. So in our wine law in Austria, a single vineyard is defined actually by this term of Ried. And, uh, this is why we made it obligatory actually on Austrian labels to indicate a single vineyard name always together with the term of Ried. So it's always like Ried Lamm, Ried Heiligenstein, Ried Leuserberg, Ried um, whatsoever. And this makes it in fact very easy for everybody uh, to instantly identify an Austrian single vineyard wine, even without knowing the name. So whenever you, you, you read uh, this, uh, this term of read on an Austrian label, you instantly know that the term afterwards is the name of a single vineyard. Single vineyards are very numerous in Austria. You have to imagine that we are talking about more than 4,000 single vineyard names in Austria. Not even we in Austria know all these names. So it's a, a very practical system even for us uh, to, uh, to, to make it easy to identify single vineyards on an, on an Austrian label. Now, the big number of uh, single vineyard names made it uh, uh, kind of obvious you know, to consider about a vineyard classification system. Now, uh, this is a project that we started in 1992 and uh, the Association of Österreichische Traditionsweingüter is an association of uh, premium wineries that started already 35 years ago or, uh, or 25 years ago. Um, let me think. Um, yeah, 25 years ago. <laughs> Uh, or more than 25 years ago, this project about a vineyard classification system. And uh, here we're differentiating the single vineyards in between the non-classified single vineyards, Erste Lage and Große Lage, which is kind of equivalent to Premier Cru and Grand Cru. I'm not going now into the details uh, about uh, the, the classification and uh, its implementations. Uh, currently, just so far, Currently, the classification is based on a, on a private classification, but we have intense talks now with the government about bringing the classification into the law. Uh, this is a, a long-term project, and uh, currently we are bringing more and more wineries actually into the system of the classification. So this is a, a development that is quite recent and uh, which will be quite important actually for the future. Um, now, I think that was a little bit an introduction, you know, on, on general topics of, the, of Austria, the Danube region and the Appalachian system. Now, I would like to say uh, a few things about, uh, about Goebbelsberg, uh, its history. Uh, you see, uh, this is a picture of the estate uh, today. And uh, we are located. Uh, we are located right in the center of the Danube region. Uh, so this is this is where Goebbelsberg is uh, located. And uh, the the estate has a history that is going back three and a half to four thousand years of uh, of settlement. 
um, used to be a classical fortress in the 11th century, was rebuilt into a Renaissance castle in the 16th century, and was brought into today's form between 1725 and 1740. And the history of the estate is uh, very much connected to the history of the Cistercian monks from, from, from Burgundy. You know that Cistercian monks came originally from, from Burgundy, uh, and were spreading in the 12th century all over Europe. And one of these monasteries was founded in the early uh, 12th century in, in our area, about half an hour north of the today's estate. And in 1171, the monks got their first uh, vineyards in, uh, uh, in, in Goebelsberg and in uh, the area of Heiligenstein. And uh, since then, we do have the recordings of the development of, of, of the monastic estate. This is why we are celebrating uh, this year the 850 years of the monastic estate. Uh, the monks have been in country to France uh, and, and Germany, uh, been, because in, in Germany and France, due to the outcomes of the French Revolution, all the monastic estates were privatized or eliminated. Uh, in Austria, we had a little bit of different history to, to monastic life, because if we had uh, with the Habsburg family, a very Catholic family uh, that made a compromise with the monks. And this is the reason why we still maintain quite a rich monastic life in Austria with all kinds of different congregations from Benedictines to Augustines um, and so on, Cistercians. And uh, so the, the monks have been running and looking after the estate themselves until quite recently, until 1995. And, uh, but as you can see, the, the average age of the monks is getting older and older. Uh, so at some stage they felt it would be difficult actually for them to look after the estate uh, at, the current, uh, at the current developments. So I had the chance in 1996 to take over the responsibility uh, for the estate. So basically I'm, I'm today together with my family, uh, my wife and our children, uh, we are kind of custodians uh, of, of the today's estate. Uh, we have a long-term relationship with, with the monks on one side based on a, on a two-generation two contract. On the other side, um, we are kind of, you know, looking after the traditions and, and the heritage of the monks and trying to bring the estate as good as we can uh, into the next generation now uh, in, in the sense uh, of, uh, of the, the monastic estate. Monks have always been uh, looking after nature. I think this is something that comes very naturally. Uh, so uh, sustainability and, uh, and, uh, and, and all these questions um, are kind of natural actually to, to monks. Um, today we are even certified uh, sustainable production. And uh, so uh, this is also a very important part, actually, of, uh, of what we are doing on, on the estate. Uh, we are concentrating in our production mainly on the wines of appellation. Uh, so wines of, of the different categories from uh, the regional expressions, the, the village expression, the single vineyard expressions. Uh, so this is uh, our main focus on what we're doing uh, on the estate. And uh, beside, you know, this main focus and this prime attention, we have a few other specialities that we also uh, have an eye on. Uh, there could be mentioned uh, sparkling production, uh, Langenlois, and, and this area became somehow the sweet spot for, for quality sparkling production in our area. So uh, some of the best sparkling producers of Austria are located just around the town of Langenlois. And so sparkling became also a quite an, an important part of our production. Uh, we're doing four different cuvées. The Brut Reserve is our classics. Then we're doing a Blanc de Blanc, which is uh, this year the, the best sparkling for Gomio in Austria. Uh, Brut Rosé and the vintage that is uh, uh, released after a after minimum of 10 years uh, lease uh, maturation. Um, so sparkling is uh, is something that we are doing on a, on you know on a quite quite significant part. Um, then red wine. Uh, this is maybe something that uh, is a 
a small part, we are, we're not doing uh, red wine because we also want to have red wine. Um, you know, it is uh, connected to uh, some geological structures that we have. As you can see here on this picture, uh, the Danube was not always as regulated as today. So the, the, the Danube went through different parts of the area and in the past millions of years, and we have uh, a certain share of our vineyards uh, looking a little bit like the Rhone Valley. So with uh, feast-sized uh, river pebbles, uh, like the Galier Roulet uh, in France. And in these vineyards, you have a very good drainage in the soil. Uh, and we are facing early dry stress situations over the summer month. And this is something that we don't like at all for white wine production. So in these vineyards, uh, we are concentrating on red wine production. Uh, as we are as Cistercian monks uh, estate, we have an old tradition in Pinot Noir. Uh, the, the monks brought Pinot, uh, long ago, uh, Pinot long ago to our area. And today we are concentrating on the whole family of Pinot Noir. So there is beside Pinot, there's Saint Laurent, which is a direct relative to Pinot. And then in the next generation, Zweig, so basically the three generations, um, which are, is the main focus uh, when it comes to this uh, yeah, cool climate red wines of, of Austria, I would say. And then uh, a, a very small segment is also sweet wine. Uh, sweet wine is, uh, is a very, very small part of our production, however, a very beloved part, uh, doing you know, a little bit of Auslese, Bärenauslese, Trockenbären Auslese, depending on the vintage. Uh, depending on the quality of botrytis that we have in the vineyards. Um, and here we are selecting in the, in the three different um, sweetness levels. And then ice wine is something that we're doing quite on a regular basis. So this is something that uh, is also something that we do uh, quite uh, regularly. And then, uh, which is also uh, quite important for us, is historical winemaking. You know, we are quite known as being a producer that has an eye uh, on uh, historical wine production. Uh, tradition is something that is particularly, has a focus on the production of the early 19th century. Uh, so there is a focus on the time between the French Revolution and the mid 19th century, uh, because it's a period uh, that is particularly focusing uh, on, on, uh, on, on a production that is looking back to an empirical knowledge of 2000 years of winemaking on one side, and on the other side is not yet influenced on, uh, not yet influenced uh, of, uh, uh, of the outcomes of industrialization. Uh, the second half of the 19th century is a period where producers and also scientists are focusing more and more on the classical industrialized question, uh, the question on how can we produce um, bigger quantities in a shorter period of time uh, with the result uh, of new innovations on the technological side, uh, but also the result that the, the craftsmanship of the winemaker is changing slowly for the next hundred of years and is changing slowly to the point where we are starting to talk about modern winemaking. Now, um, I can, I will say maybe a few things uh, about this, uh, maybe, uh, maybe later on, um, but uh, maybe Barbara, how are we with timing? Shall um, I say a little bit more, more about Vintage 2020 or what would you like me to add at this point? Um, well, I, I, one thing I will say is that the tradition wines have only just landed in Ireland today, literally this afternoon, along with five other palettes that we had um, coming from Austria. Uh, I think um, I'm, I'm really particularly interested in the tradition wines. If, if you want to say something about the 2020 vintage, that could be um, quite interesting because I, I, I personally don't know anything about, uh, about what really happened about the COVID year and what winemaking and what the vintage conditions were, were like. Um, if you feel it's important to say something about that, then yeah, please do. That would be great. Because I mean, certainly we see a lot of vintage variation uh, in the um, single vineyard wines. Some years have much greater acidity. Some years have obviously got much, um, uh, even a little bit of botrytis on some of the wines. Some years are, are more opulent than others. 
Okay. Um, uh, in that case, uh, I, I make it, um, I make it uh, very short, uh, just to, to have a few comments. Uh, I, can, I think that the, the most important aspect about 2020 uh, is that 2020 is quite different actually to the vintage in France and Germany, because our colleagues in France and Germany have experiencing a quite hot and, and dry vintage in 2020, whereas in Austria, it was just the contrary. Uh, looking here uh, to, to these numbers, you can see that uh, we, uh, we had a very dry winter time, uh, and then rainfall starts basically in May, with a peak in July with more than 200 liters, uh, which is very unusual actually for, for Austria and, and, and this area. Um, you know, com comparing it to 2019, uh, we are looking to an average precipitation of about 400, uh, a little bit more than 400 liters, which is about, you know, the average what we normally have here in this area, like 450. But in 2020, uh, we, had, uh, we had about more than 700 liters, so about 50% more than that. Also, the average temperatures are about three degrees cooler than, than in 2019 which is quite significant. So I think this is something that you, you will feel, you know, um, tasting the wines uh, the next days or weeks, that uh, 2020 is a vintage that is, uh, belongs to the rather foolish vintages um, and uh, uh, a vintage that is carried by a little bit higher acidity and, and the pungent fruit. Um, so it's a, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a lovely vintage um, and uh, I think it's a it's a vintage that brings uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, drink flow and, and 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 drink fun if if you want to say that. Um, there are just a, a just very briefly a few picks uh, from 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 the harvest uh, last year that were taken in the beginning of November because we we are harvesting you know quite early uh, quite late in the year. Uh, we, normally we start in the end of September beginning of October and then we end up uh, sometimes in the mid-November. Mid uh, so here, just some few impressions, uh, how the scenery looked uh, last year in the beginning of, of November. This is the Tower of Heiligenstein, you know, uh, the, the, the basically the Grand Cru in, in our area, one of the most important Riesling singing uh, This is Geisberg, uh, and. This is how we uh, are picking, we are picking in, this is a picture of Harvest 31, so 90 years ago. You can see everything was still field blend and stock culture, but today we are harvesting in small boxes, you know, with uh, different colors. So we can do a first selection in the vineyards and then we do a second selection then on the sorting table. And then uh, the, 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 uh, the juices are going then into the fermentation cask. Uh, and, um, uh, and and for, for, for the fermentation. Yes, uh, talking about uh, the, the, the special tradition wine that just arrived, um, it's a wine that is in the context of the 800 years celebration and in the context we, we, uh, we, we built um, uh, a little cellar extension uh, in the past uh, five years. Uh, which is uh, quite spectacular. I hope to be able to welcome you um, in, in the next month or year. Uh, I really you know, would love to, to do that. Um, but talking about uh, the tradition 50 years, which is kind of a jubilee wine that we, uh, that we created uh, uh, in the last year. And it's a wine that pays homage to, um, to uh, to, to what we believe is, you know, kind of the essence of the Danube area. Um, so, you know, uh, I asked the abbot, uh, because we, we have a library that is going back to the 40s and uh, with quite uh, some significant stocks. And I asked the abbot if it would be possible, you know, to get hold on these stocks. And uh, he was very excited actually about this idea. And he gave me a carte blanche and he said, well, you know, whatever you think is, is appropriate, you know, for such a wine. And uh, so we, uh, we, we, took, uh, we, we took wines actually from the 70s, 80s and 90s actually from, from this library. And uh, 
so this is a picture actually of the of, of the of the library and uh, from here we took them the, the bottles uh, cleaned them and uh, opened them uh, bottle by bottle tasted them and we emptied them then back into, uh, into 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 small casks and from there on you know we 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 went on with the blending until uh, the the final cuvee was was done and uh, we did not use all the vintages of the past 50 years. Uh, you, you, this is, you can see here what vintages were used for the, for the final cuvee. Uh, you can count that about uh, one third of the, of the wine uh, is uh, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Then there is one third is, which is coming from, from the 2000s, and there is one third which is coming from the 10s. Um, and uh, uh, and it's not only one grape variety, because, uh, you know, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, we still had a lot of different grape varieties uh, in, in, in the assortment. Uh, so beside Gruner Veltliner and Riesling, uh, we're looking here to Gruner, uh, to Gruner Silvana, to Muscat Silvana, Riesling Silvana, Welsh Riesling, Muscato Tunnel, Tramina, Muscatella, Neuburger. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a wide variety actually of, of great varieties, and uh, uh, so uh, we yeah we we are very excited actually about uh, about uh, uh, this wine because uh, I think you know the result is is a wine that somehow represents the best attitudes of this area. It's a wine that has uh, a nice decent aroma. Uh, it's not an, a show-off wine, you know. It's uh, it's not a wine that is carried, you know, by by full power and concentration. It's rather in the country. I think it's a wine that is, um, you know, in the best sense, a good representative of of, of the Danube area, with about twelve point five um, alcohol, um, with a, a good and lively acidity, um, and uh, it's uh, it's a wine that has a, a very good drink flow. It's a it's a wine that you know that is really a good food companion, and I think this is what at the end you know the Danube area is all about. You know when you're looking to the culture of wine of Austria, then we have to say that Austrian wine is has always been food companion. This is something that really differentiates us from you know from Germany, uh, because our culture is really laid down that our wines have always been enjoyed together with food. And uh, so this is a very important aspect, you know, when it comes uh, to Austrian wine. Uh, and uh, also we as winemakers, you know, we have a special eye on that, that our wines are always, you know, good as, as food companions. Um, and I think this is, um, yeah, basically, you know, the most important thing that I wanted to, uh, to say about uh, tradition and this, uh, this very special uh, Cuvée um, 50 years uh, as the Jubilee wine uh, of the estate for this year. Beside the 50 year Cuvée, uh, we will release uh, this year a 10 year and a three year uh, tradition. Um, but more, uh, more information on these two wines uh, is, is to come. And because I don't want to, to press too much on time, because I think that Dorley's, uh, you know, should uh, also have a say now a little bit more on Kanuntum, uh, Burgenland, and uh, the culture and traditions of red wine production in Austria. Thank you, Michael. That's um, fantastic. And I, you know, I, I think the estate is in very good hands in your hands, if I can say that. And. I think the tradition wine is very much looking forward to trying them and, and to having other people try them too.